evening, Cherries fans, and welcome to this latest special show here on Up the Cherries in All Departments. Before I welcome on my very special guest tonight, here's a little bit about our sponsors, Dental on the Banks. To find out what they can do for you, visit dentalonthebanks.co.uk. Now, our special guest tonight is a goalkeeper. He started his career in 1986 with Wolverhampton Wanderers. He then had loan spells at Blackpool, Cheltenham and West Bromwich Albion before joining the club. He then played at Arsenal before playing for Huddersfield and Gillingham, where he actually won the playoff final. It is a pleasure to welcome onto the show Vince Bartram. Evening, Vince. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good to have you on the show, and thank you so much for joining me and Matt on this special show tonight. Um, so let's start off where it all began. So you was born, born in Birmingham. Um, you attended Hagley RC High School. Um, was it during your school days that you started playing football? Yeah, uh, well, I, oh, I mean, we moved around a bit. You say I, I attended Hagley. You know, I ended up there at 12. Before then, I, I sort of had four or five different schools. We, we moved about sort of uh, uh, the, the, the West Midlands, uh, you know, sort of Quinton, Howes Owen, sort of... Uh, even into sort of Edgebaston and then moved out to a place called Cannock near Wolverhampton um, for, for two or three years. And I joined a club there as a what, what we call under nines now. Um, in those days, I, I wanted to be a centre forward, but I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. Um, and uh, I, I stopped playing for a couple of years, uh, just played school football. And then, like I say, moved to Hagley um, and uh, got in with a, a group of lads. It was a, a, a nice school. Got in with a good group of mates. Uh, and at 13, uh, sort of, uh, you know, messing around on the field one day. And one of the lads said, oh, you, you're good in goal. You should play in goal. And I was like, well, Nick's the goalkeeper. You know, I, I, you know, I don't want to sort of take his. But Nick was like, well, I don't want to play in goal. You can play in goal. So th that was it. And just for a couple of years, uh, sort of played for the school. And then at, uh, I was 14 um, and got a phone call from a club called Old Swinford. Um, you know, sort of my, my two boys are just sort of playing grassroots football, sort of, you know, my, my eldest is at Christchurch and Old Swinford were, was similar to sort of a Christchurch, Wessex League, Dorset Premier League sort of team. They were in the West Midlands um, and this guy was setting up an under-15s team for them. Um, so I joined. Uh, played under 15s, but also played. They had a, a, an under 18s team that sort of played and had in the league and played in the Youth Cup. And they had a third team that played in a, a, a well, it was basically a pub league around Dudley in the, the Black Country. Um, and then the reserves played in the West Midlands Division Two. And the first team played in the West Midlands Premier League. And after four, uh, no, two years there, um, I was 16. Uh, at the end of the season, um, uh, sort of just about to go into 17, I'd stayed on at school for one year and I managed to get in, into their first team, played four games for their first team and Wolves were looking at a centre-forward at, at Old Swinford at the same time and ended up taking the two of us at the end of the season, a lad called Neil Edwards and myself. Um, and, you know, that's that's basically how 
how I ended up being a professional goalkeeper. Um, yeah, Vince, when did you um, decide that goalkeeping was for you then? Well, I'd say around sort of 12, 13, uh, you know, I'd, uh, I played a couple of games. I'd come on and I remember, you know, probably scoring one goal in my whole whole life as a centre forward. And um, like I say, it, it just is something I, I always enjoyed. So, you know, we used to play Wembley and headers and volleys and I'd go in goal and, you know, you'd make a few saves and, oh, oh, yeah. And, and then when people around you start going, oh, you know, it's the, the peer thing, isn't it? You know, when your mates are telling you, oh, you're good, do this, do that. And as soon as I bought my first pair of gloves, you know, literally, you know, that, that day that the lad said, or Nick said to me, I don't want to play in goal. I, I think the next day, um, you know, went into Birmingham with my mum and dad, bought a, a goalkeeper shirt, bought my first pair of proper goalkeeping gloves. And and that was it, you know, just uh, just never looked back, fell, fell in love with the position and, um, probably, you know, a bit different to how some of the, the modern keepers do it. I, you know, it's never in an academy. I never sort of had any trials apart from, you know, until Wolves, uh, you know, came in and offered me at 17. Um, I was I was lucky, like I said, I've got a good group of mates. Um, my best mate, Darren Wassell, ended up uh, going and playing. He was in, he was at Notts Forest at the time and he had a good career at Forest and Derby, Birmingham. Um, Lee Sharp was two or three years younger than us. Um, you know Steve Gwine, and so you know, we all came from all came from Hagley. Who, Vince, who did you support um, during your childhood? I was I was a baggy mate. I was a West Brom fan. Brought up, uh, you know, my family are all from the, the like say the, the Black Country, Smethwick. Uh, you know, my dad's office was was literally about a quarter of a mile from from the Hawthorns. And as a kid, I you know was a season ticket holder. I was brought up with Cyril Regis, Laurie Cunningham. You know Tony Gordon, that you know they were they were a really good team. Um, yeah, yeah. So I was a, a West Brom fan. How was it like playing for Wolves after being a West Brom fan? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, that's you know people talk about rivalries, and you know fans probably don't. It, it's probably hard for them to to. Uh, I wouldn't say accept it, but to understand that, you know, I, I, I was at Wolves. I was being paid by Wolves. I trained with them um, as a, you know in my younger days. I wasn't in the first team squad, so when the first team were away, I'd go and watch. You know, so one Saturday I'm at the Hawthorns watching Albion. The Saturday after I'm at Molyneux watching the Wolves, and you know, I've got good friends that are Wolves fans. I've got good friends that are Albion fans, and even today, you know, I'm, I still, you know, I still speak to got allegiances to to both sides. So to me, um, you know, you you take as you find. Um, it, you know, it, it was a sad day, the day that Steve Ball scored a winner at the last minute at the Hawthorns for Wolves to win the game. You know, and I jumped up and cheered, and you know, looking back, I, you know, there's, there's probably a part of me that <laughs> maybe regrets that. But um, you know, that's what you do. You, as a pro, you know, professional, you 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 you're paid to you know to, for, to be at a club, and you know, well, while you're at that club, it's they're the be all and end all. Yeah. Okay. Um, so signing for Wolves in 1985, was it? Yeah. I, yeah. There's, there's, it's not straightforward. I, I was at school. I stayed on at school doing A levels. I was one year into my A levels. Um, Wolves. I mean, you know, again, you're going to talk about Bournemouth. I think, and the, uh, you know, the, uh, the the sad days. And Wolves were. That's exactly where Wolves were. The, they hadn't got any money. The, the Batty brothers. They were, you know, two sides of the ground. Both, yeah, two sides of the ground were closed. You know, they were, it was unsafe. Um, and Wolves offered me. Uh, uh, it, you know, to this day, that's a joke. It was one of the best contracts I had. I was still at school, um, you know, doing A levels. But Wolves signed me on what they called non-contract forms. They gave me fifty pound a week. Uh, you know, it was literally cash in hand. Um, but I, I, I signed that form, and then twelve months later, uh, you know, I, I signed. Uh, I, I finished my A levels, and I, I, I signed full time. Uh, as a pro, I wasn't on much more money, but uh, you know, it's yeah, yeah, and you know, sort of that's that's how I got into it. So you made your debut uh, for the club in the uh, fourth division. Uh, Eighty, yeah, nineteen eighty-six, Cambridge at home. Cambridge at home, two-one defeat. If I'm yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, yeah. What do you remember about your debut? Um, well, it probably started. All oh, the story probably started. Uh, I don't know a month, six weeks before that. Uh, Tim Flowers was the first team goalkeeper, and they uh, Wolves sold him to Southampton. Um, Scott Barrett was the backup keeper. First day pre season, he did his knee, needed a cartilage operation. Um, so I basically went through pre season as the only goal, only fit goalkeeper at the club. Um, 
Brian Little was the manager. Uh, like I say, Wolves were, you know, the lowest of the low at the times. The Batty Brothers, uh, you know, you know, if you talk to Wolves fans, you know, the, uh, there's a there's a symmetry with with Bournemouth probably that you know the the club were very close to going out of existence. Um, and I think it was more, you know, uh, it was a case that I had to play. There were five five of us all teenagers making our debut that day. Um, you know, Brian Little was the manager. A uh, legend from his Villa days, you know, a, a lovely guy. Um, and I just, I, I've, I've said that, you know, I've done interviews like this before. And, you know, I, I, so I, I was quite blase. I look back now and I think, was, was that really me? You know, I just, I just turned up and played football. I, you know, I, I didn't think, oh my God, I'm playing football league. I'm playing at Molyneux. You know, they've, I've had 50,000 people here and stuff. Like that. I just went out and played football and um, I did. I did my best. Uh, I, th- I think we, we lost with a last minute goal. I uh, got lobbed uh, the last minute. Um, I thought I'd done all right, but literally the Monday morning, then um, Brian Little pulled me into the office. Sort of said, "Look, son, you know you're going to be a good keeper, but it, it's too soon for you. I need to protect you. Uh, we're going. We're, we've, we're going to get someone in on loan." And uh, he said, "But I need you for the cup. Uh, I need you for the league cup at Lincoln next week." And uh, and that was it. And uh, you know, like, his, like I say, he brought in Eric Nixon. And then, uh, you know, sort of other keepers came in and I didn't play another league game for six years, you know, five years, I think it was. Um, and, and, you know, but that, that, you know, I was just blasé about it. Like I say, I was, I was a young kid. I'd, I'd had no goalkeeping coaching. I was now at this professional club. I, um, you know, we, we had a goalkeeping coach come in a couple of days a week and it, it was groundbreaking for me. And I was just loving it. And, you know, uh, I didn't mind if I was playing or not. I didn't, you know, I didn't think like that in those days and all this about, you know, competing for a place. I just, you know, yeah, I was, I was just playing football and someone was giving me some money to, to do it. You did have some tough competition between the sticks of Molyneux throughout the years there um, with the likes of Mark Kendall and Mike Stoll. How was training daily with those guys and did they teach you anything about the game? Yeah, obviously, you know, sort of, uh, Kendo, you know, bless him, uh, you know, he's not with us any longer, you know, taken far too soon. Uh, but he, he was a, you know, a big influence. He was probably, you know, I'd, like I say, Tim had been at the club for 12 months. I'd, I'd only been going in one day a week. So I had a few sessions with him. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so he was a young keeper trying to make a name for himself as well. So, I, you know, while I got on well and, you know, when we trained together, it wasn't, you know, we were sort of individuals, um, but Kendo came in and, you know, he really took me under his wing, um, you know, and then we had, uh, you know, goalkeeping coach Eric Steele came in two days a week and, you know, that was a massive influence for me as well. Uh, and I just learned, I learned a lot. Uh, and then there were times, like you say, Stowley came in, uh, there's another guy, Tony Lang, that the club brought in as well at one stage. So sometimes I was like third choice goalkeeper and, I'd play out. I'd, I'd sort of go in, you know, sort of sessions. Um, you know, Graham Turner, the manager at the time, used to have a set Thursday morning that, you know, you knew what you were doing, you know, even before we turned up. And some days, uh, he, he, he loved this 9v9 and, it, you know, we had a set of rules in the 9v9. But if we hadn't got enough players, I'd play, I'd play as an outfield player. So some days I'd be marking Steve Ball or Andy Much. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not good enough to mark these, but I've got Kendo or Mike Stell behind me, communicating, t- teaching me, telling me what to do. And in my head, I'm learning, A, what I need to do when I'm there from a communication point, but I'm also learning how to defend to mark Steve Ball. So when I am in goal, I can then talk to my defenders about how to, how to um, you know, uh, what I need from my defenders and from a goalkeeping point. So that, you know... Just the, the whole experience, uh, you know, I, I came on sort of leaps and bounds with it and, and working with those guys, like I say, Kendo. <laughs> uh, I don't know how, you know, if you, you remember him or you ever saw him play. Um, he was, uh, he, he was, you, you wouldn't call him the finest athlete you've ever seen. You know, he, he carried a, like I am now, carrying a few pounds too many, but he was an unbelievable goalkeeper. He, he could make some unbelievable saves. He'd catch crosses and... He's probably the goalkeeper that I've seen and, well, before Edison came along. The, the assists where he'd catch a ball and he'd, he'd got this drive half volley that he'd drive you know, from a, from a counter-attack and Andy Much would flick it on and Bully would score. And, you know, I'd, I lost count of the number of goals that uh, Kendo was an assist for. So, uh, yeah, yeah lots, lots to learn from those guys uh, as, as a young goalkeeper growing up. 
Um, you had seven home games um, during this time. Uh, Blackpool, Cheltenham, um, West Brom. Uh, did you enjoy your time at those clubs? Yeah, yeah. You know, again, later on, I think we'll probably talk about what I'm doing now and, you know, passing on my experience and that, you know, things like that were, were good experiences. Um, Blackpool was fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I played league football. Um, I, like I say, I, I made my debut for Wolves and then I probably had 18 months sort of away from it, sort of uh, 18s and uh, uh, reserve football. <clears throat> and then um, Blackpool offered me a chance of first team football for a couple of months and that, that was a good experience, enjoyed that. Cheltenham, I thought, oh God, was that the following season or, um, <clears throat> it, again, it was literally, they'd got, Jim Barron was the, the manager. Um, he'd been at Wolves when I first came in um, uh, and then he was there and he got an experienced goalkeeper in Paul Barron, um, but Paul had had a cartilage operation and it was literally, you know, sort of, uh, they needed someone for four or five weeks and I went in, started the season. They were in the conference in those days and, I remember thinking, uh, you know, the, the first game of the season we played Gateshead and, oh my God, I'll never forget the game. I think every single member of the Gateshead team was 6-3, 6-4. It was, it was brutal. They, you know, it was Wimbledon, you know, with some, um, you know, did well, learned about crosses and how to protect myself. And I remember that month going back to Wolves thinking, you know, no disrespect to those guys, but I, I need to be better than conference football or conference in those days. Uh, you know, it was brutal, and I, it, it was that was a good month for me. It was a, it was an eye opener, and I, you know, it was something that really kicked me on. <clears throat> and then well, uh, the West Brom thing um, again that that was going as cover. Um, Mel Reese and bless his soul, another one that's gone. Uh, um, he was he was the backup keeper to um, Stuart Naylor, uh, and obviously being a West Brom fan, you know, just a chance to go and. You know, be at be at West Brom for four or five weeks. I think six weeks in the end. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that that was just as cover, but to to help West Brom at the time. Um, you know, we were I think they were pushing for promotion. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it, I, I didn't really play much. I played sort of uh, you know res, a few reserve games. Um, but I knew probably my time at Wolves was coming to an end. I knew I, you know I needed to try and. So sort of just put my name about to to try and get a move, and um, ironically, um, <laughs> I was at West Brom, and uh, the, the, they played Wolves at Molyneux, and um, Mike Stell did his cruciate in the game, and literally uh, Wolves said, "Look, we're, we're calling you back." Um, there were seven games left in the season. Called me back. Tony Lang played two or three, and then um, they stuck me in for the last four games of the season. I did really well. Um, you know, four four really good games. Uh, played Middlesbrough away, Blackburn away, Hull at home, and Portsmouth home. Last game of the season, you know, um, did really well. And Wolves offered me a, a, a new contract to stay, but I turned it down because you know I knew I knew I needed first team football. And of course, at that point, you joined Bournemouth, um, and that was in 1991 for 35,000. What attracted you to Dean Court in particular? <laughs> um, I don't, like I said, I, I had a phone call. Um, I, it was a long summer, waiting for the phone to ring, and I, I won't lie, I didn't get too many calls. Um, you know, and then I was uh, just about to go back to pre-season with Wolves. Uh, you know, sort of thinking, well, hopefully something's going to happen. And uh, I, I think I'd been away on holiday for a week, and sort of came back. And my mum, in those days, you sent your details off to the PFA, and they let all the clubs know. And you just waited for a phone call. You know, there were no agents or anything like that. And uh, literally got home and mum and dad said, oh, the, this, this guy, Harry's called, wants you to go down to Bournemouth and have a chat. Um, so, you know, I had to look where Bournemouth was on the map for a you know, 22, 23-year-old lad from the Midlands. I, I wasn't too sure where Bournemouth was in those days. Um, you know, and uh, I came down and uh, met Harry. Um, he did the usual trick. He put me in the raw bath for a night. And, you know, I thought that was what Bournemouth was. Uh, he took me for for a meal at an Italian restaurant. I didn't realise he was he was invested in it at the time and and all that. So you know, uh, yeah, um, and you know, we had had talks, uh, and then the next day he drove me around town, and I was like, oh yeah, this you know, twenty three years old, this this could be nice, and uh, you know, drove me right down the sandbanks and you know, along the seafront and showed me the training. I was like, yeah, yeah, uh, and and it just he just said to me, look, you know. Um, 
I want you to come and be number one. And, it, you know, for, for a lad that, you know, had, uh, had had six years at Wolves and probably 10 first team appearances, <clears throat> you know, it was the chance to come and, and put games on my CV was, was you know, just, uh, I, you know, it was a chance I couldn't turn down. Um, what was Harry like to work under? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, he, he was he was great, uh, you know, and I, you know, I still see him occasionally. Um, you know, I, I owe him everything, um, you know, because it almost you know did put me on the map in in goalkeeping terms, um, you know, and I, I owe Harry and, and Bournemouth, uh, you know, everything for that. Um, <coughs> Harry was Harry, uh, you know, what he sees, what he get. Um, is he the best coach I've ever worked under? Probably not. Is he the, one of the best motivators you've ever worked under? Probably, you know, you just wanted to play for him. Um, you know, you, you wanted to do your best. Um, you know, he had good people around him. You know, Tony Pulis, uh, you know, not, he's not everyone's famous uh, first choice at, at Bournemouth. But, you know, for, and again, Tony did brilliant for me. Um, you know, he, he was a different type of person to, to Harry. Um, but, you know, we, we'd got good people. Um, uh, and like I say, you just wanted to play. Uh, you know, a lot of experience in the team when I first came down. And uh, yeah, it was you know I, I was I just loved it right from the you know the first day, the first training session, uh, the first game, walking out at the old Dean Court. You know that that's still Dean Court to me, not that new place up the road. Uh, you know the old Dean Court, uh, you know <laughs> in front of the South Stand with the clock and everything. You know it's uh, yeah yeah I just, I just loved every every minute. Uh, you know and and it was it was challenging. Um, you know and uh, Harry was was Harry. Uh, you know. We, Five asides up in you know, literally just across the road from Kings Park, and you know I remember training there with with Harry and five asides, and Harry being on the wing and crossing the ball, and like that's how you do it, boys, and you know it's yeah yeah he, he was a motivator, and you know just enjoyed uh, enjoyed well unfortunately it was only twelve months playing for him, but uh, you know enjoyed it. Of course, we finished eighth in your first season. Is it disappointing that you didn't reach the playoffs? And do you think that squad should have gone up? Uh, yeah, I never really thought about it to be honest. Um, you know, again, like I say, I, whether it's a fault of mine, I, I just I just live game by game and day by day, and you know, sort of, uh, I, I like playing for those three points and. You know, again, I'll show my age, turning teletext on and seeing how many places you'd moved up on a Saturday night. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really look at it. I, I think we had a slow start to the season. Um, and then we sort of we picked up and came with a bit of a run. And, yeah, I remember going to Hartlepool last game of the season and it was a big, ugly centre-forward that sort of uh, terrorised us that day. And we ended up signing the big the big. Hander up front, Fletch. Um, yeah, and he, he cost he cost us a, a place in the playoffs, and uh, yeah, it was a long it was a long journey back. Uh, but I don't I don't think you know I don't I never got the feeling that uh, you know it was oh you know we were going to get promoted. I, I don't remember that. Said so it was a good team and you know a lot of good lads. Um, There's probably more disappointment uh, maybe in the fans. So I I. I Again, whether that's a fault of mine, I I didn't take that on board. Um, you know, I'd, I'd loved it. I'd uh, you know, to me, we'd had a great season and couldn't wait for the next one. Rather than you know being too disappointed about missing out on the playoffs. Um, you played in the FA Cup game um, at St James's Park against Newcastle. <coughs> uh, what can you remember about the game and the uh, penalty shootout? <sighs> Again, I can't. <laughs> I remember it was obviously a replay. Um, I think that we'd had a rather boring nil-nil at Dean Court. Um, I actually remember that, uh, you know, we flew up. Harry uh, got a plane for us to fly up. Um, I think some of the vice presidents had, you know, were, were on board and subsidised it or whatever. Um, but I actually pulled my graph and we had West Brom on the Saturday and I tweaked my groin. Um, and then we flew up to Newcastle and I don't know if you guys remember um the fog and it actually got abandoned the first game got abandoned after 15 minutes uh and i was probably you know i was so happy about that because you know everyone was moaning about you know we'd flown up and we've got to fly back and you know would we be able to do it and i was thinking thank god you know i've got a chance to let my groin settle down and you know i might be okay for for the next game because i, I was struggling that game 
Um, and then, um, yeah, we went back up. I, I can't remember too much. Obviously, I've seen, you know, see the footage, uh, you know, the goals, and we, we, we gave them a good game. Um, they were obviously under a lot of pressure. Uh, I think it was one of our Beelis' last games, if I remember right. Um, and it, I just remember penalties. And like I say, I, I was lucky enough to sort of, you know, one hit me and, uh, you know, that was, the, you know, looked up and I just saw these lads running at me. And I, I see the, I say, I see the footage now and, you know, I don't know but it's embarrassing, you know, little skits and, and then you get mobbed. But, you know, I remember being in the dressing room after and, you know, it's, uh, it, yeah, it was the sort of thing that you think, yeah, this is this is what I want. This is why you you want to be a footballer for the good days. Um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's funny. It, it, the memories sort of fade, um, but the, the that sense of that achievement and that that pride in what you did uh, that that doesn't go. What do you think your best performance was at Bournemouth, Vince? <sighs> crikey, crikey. Um, Probably paying the mortgage every week. That was a challenge at some some weeks. Um, uh, I just, yeah, I, I can't remember that. You know, there's like you know, I, I'm funny. I remember weird things. I remember playing Torquay. Uh, we played Torquay on a Tuesday night, and Torquay were bottom of the league. And I, you know, I, it was one of the best games I ever had. And then the 95th minute, there was a cross come in, and for some reason, I thought it was going wide. I let it go and. It went right in the top corner, and it's like oh, you know, and got a long trip back from Torquay. So we go, you know, then on the Friday night. So Torquay were bottom; they go off the bottom. Swansea were then bottom. Friday night, we're away at Swansea at the Vetchfield, and you know they tore us, they tore us apart that night. But again, I did well. You know, so it, yeah, you know, I'm not one that um, you know through my career. I, I you know, I, I was I was pride that you know sort of probably consistent. Um, you know, yeah, there's there's good performances that, that I remember, um, but I'm not one. You know, I don't sort of sit back and egos and stuff like that. Uh, I, yeah, plus I'm getting older. I can't remember those days. <laughs> Ninety <laughs> one's a long time ago now. So uh, um, yeah, I'm struggling to probably pick one out if I'm being honest. Uh, I know we just briefly touched on it, but. Um... How did Tony Pulis compare to Harry? Is there anything that stands out that in memory that put them totally different between each other? Or no, that to, to me they're they're probably chalk and cheese in you know their their outlook on on the game, their philosophy on the game. Um, but but that that's probably you know they probably work well as a as a pairing, um, and that's probably why you know when when Harry left, Tony took over. You know, he hadn't got that support probably. Um, you know, I, th- I think he, you know, he's gone on to prove that he's a good manager. Um, you know, uh, at the time, he, he probably didn't have the people around him that he needed, maybe. Um, you know, I, I, there's there's nothing wrong. I've, you know, uh, Tone's outlook was, you know, if, if you keep a clean sheet, you only have to score one goal. Whereas Harry's like, well, if you if you concede four, we'll score five. And, you know, to me, that, that, that sums up their philosophies. You know, in, in similar ways, you know, I go to Arsenal and you've got George Graham that was renowned for the, the famous back four or back five and, you know, Arsenal 1-0. And then, you know, uh, Arsene Wenger comes in and, you know, he's, he's got a totally different philosophy as well. So, um, to me, it doesn't mean one one's right and one's wrong. They, they both had a, a big influence and obviously Tony especially and, you know, ended up playing for him uh, again at Gillingham, uh, you know, l- later on. Vince, who would you say is the best player that was at Deanport during your time? <laughs> uh, I'm still friends. I'm still friends with some of them, so I better get. <laughs> Fletch might watch this as well. <laughs> oh, no, I don't know. He's he's well down the list. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, no, again, I, you know, I've asked. You know, I've done interviews for different clubs, and you know, Arsenal, and and people. Like, you know, people ask me who's the best player at Arsenal, and you know, it's like my my stock answer to that is well, you know, you can you can have eleven Dennis Burkhams, you won't win anything, but he's probably the best player I've ever you know had the privilege to be on a football pitch with. You know, you need a Tony Adams, you need a Ray Parler, and you know, Bournemouth's the same in in those respects. You know, you know, um, one of my best mates, uh, Guppy uh, Mark Morris, you know. He's one of the best defenders I've played with. You know, he'd be the first to me. He's probably not. Well, he, you know, he wouldn't. Admit to, you know, he thinks he's a silky winger at times as well. But you know, he he, he was like you know, 
hard centre half, you know, win at win at all costs, uh, you know, uh, and and you know, great great lad to to sort of uh, play behind, you know. You got Mozzie, you know, sort of left back, Keithy Rowe, you know. I think <clears throat> the, the problem that, you know, when you ask that question with me, a lot of the lads I played with at Bournemouth were young and probably didn't show how good they were until they went, you know, they went on. Um, you know, Keithy's a good example. Neil Masters, you know, was a good player. Um, you know, Joe Parkinson. Uh, you know, we, we had some good players. And then obviously you've got the, the other end of the spectrum, people like Casey, you know, Jimmy Case, what a player he was. And he showed signs of it with us, uh, you know, in those 12 months. But, you know, and you just, you know, I remember a couple of games thinking, wow, I'd, you know, I'd love to have seen him in his prime and his pump. Um so you know, I, I don't think it's. I don't like saying who the best one was. Um, you know, we, we had some good players, and I think you know that um, they, you know, everyone I played with uh, proved that they, they were there on merit. Um, you know, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to sit on the fence on that one if you don't mind. No, that's fair enough, Vince. Not a problem at all. <clears throat> um, so an offer of two hundred fifty thousand from Arsenal uh, was enough for the Cherries board to sell sell you on. Um, what do you remember from that time? <laughs> what about how the move came, or uh, well, just about the whole the whole process? How the move came? Oh, uh, did you? I did. I mean, you know, I I thought I'd probably, you know, there's there was a chance I was going to move the year before. Um, uh, there was there was talk of Forest, um, Blackburn as well. Um, you know, sort of Kenny Dalglish came to watch me in a friendly at Farnborough or something. I, you know, you hear these stories. Um, and nothing, nothing materialised. And then I was out of contract. Um, <clears throat> again, Tony sort of pulled me in the office, uh, you know, and he sort of jokingly sort of handed me a, a new offer. And he, he he said, look, you know, I know you're not going to sign it. He said, to be honest, I don't think we can afford to pay it anyway. So, um, you know, uh, they needed to they needed to sell me. Um, and uh, to be honest, so I was going to go to Leicester. Um, I sort of saw Tony. I, I, he was packing up. He just had the sack. He was sort of putting his goods into a, into a little cardboard box in his office. And, you know, I said, oh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks for everything. Um, he said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm, I'm off now to talk to Leicester. <clears throat> and I was literally driving out from Dean Court. And um, there's a little little shop just uh, on the way out on the left-hand side. And uh, there was an old Billy Walker who used to be the, um, the the greenkeeper over at Queen's Park Golf Club. He, you know, we knew him well. And, um, he he played back for, in the day for Newcastle and he's crossing the road in front of me and I stopped and he's like, well, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm off to Leicester. Uh, and he said, oh, don't. He said, my my uh, good friend um, is Steve Burnshaw, the chief scout at Arsenal. He said, they've been looking at you. He said, don't, don't sign for Leicester until you've heard from me. And literally as I'm driving up the motorway, uh, you know, I, I get a call from Arsenal. Um, so I went to talk to to Leicester, who was Brian Little, who'd given them a debut at Wolves, so there was a connection there. Um, and then, literally, we went to Leicester, straight from Leicester, went down to Arsenal, and uh, yeah, had uh, had the decision to make, do I go to Leicester, where I've got a chance of competing for, for a first team spot? I think they got Gavin Ward, Russell Holt, Kevin Poole, and myself, and Brian Little was saying, look, you know, you're as good as, as anyone, but I'm, I'm not guaranteeing anything. Or there was Arsenal where George Graham was saying, we've got the best keeper in, well, in England and in, in Europe, in the world maybe, um, but we want you to come and be number two to him. Um, and it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it wasn't an easy choice, uh, you know, I have to say. What was it like being understudy to David Seaman and also training with him every day? Yeah, you know, you know, you sort of go in and, Again, I, I wasn't, I wasn't like a, I wouldn't call myself in those days a student of the game. I wasn't, you know, I'd, I'd watch a football, but you know, I wasn't like a, a nerd. I didn't know everyone. I didn't know too much. You know, I'll be honest, I didn't know too much about the, about Arsenal and the, the back four and the players. And and then you go in there, and it's like, wow, wow. And you know, goal, call him goalie. Um, you know, Seaman, he he, he was he was the best. Uh, he was that good. He made things look look easy and simple. Um, and, you know, I just got so much respect for him. He's, he is the best keeper I've ever seen in life. Um, you know, in working with him every day and Bob Wilson, um, you know, to have him as your goalie coach, um, you know, just, uh, you know, 
treating you with the same respect and and sort of uh, advising you. Not try, and Bob's great thing was he he didn't try and make me into Dave Seaman. Um, you know, he he looked at my techniques and there was a couple of little things. Uh, you know, and he, he said, "I'm not going. You know, that works for you. I'm not going to try and change that." Um, and that's that's what made Bob so great. Um, you know, and and I say I had <clears throat> I had two years where I was number two, uh, and then sort of a, I, I turned down a new contract, went on to uh, a, a week to week contract, got injured first game of pre season while I was trying to get a move, and and I was out for three months. And by the time I was fit again, Alex Mann and was at the club. John Lukic had come back, um, so that all of a sudden you're down the pecking order and. Those last sort of 12, 18 months were a little difficult. They were probably the hardest time in my career, but you're still at a club like Arsenal, um, you know, and training with, with great players all the time. You did play a number of games for Arsenal. What was it like having the famous Gunners back line of Dixon, Adams, Bold and Winterburn in front of you? They were a fantastic back four, but would you say that they're the best back four that you've ever played with <laughs> yeah no again I've got sort of, but Mozzie uh, Mark Morris Keithy if you're watching this you know I, I do apologise but yeah, yeah they you know they, they were in the you know they, they were that that season that couple of seasons they were they were probably difficult seasons for Arsenal there's you know I went there and um, you know sort of within six months George Graham had gone uh, being sat because of the bung scandal um, there were things about the players, you know, Tony Adams, Mercy. You know, I don't have to go over them, but you know, there, there was a lot of <clears throat> disrupt at the club, shall we say? And um, you know, it, it, it affected on the pitch a little bit, but you know, you could still see the quality of the players, and you know, they proved it. Um, you know, sort of, you know, later years again, going on and winning doubles and stuff like that, and you know, the, the likes of Baldy and Tony playing into their late into their 30s, um, you know, they, they showed that uh, they'd got that quality. Um, to me, uh, you know, it, it, it was a privilege. Uh, I, I signed for the club just to, you know, the chance to pull that shirt on once, to play a high, you know, to walk into those marble hallways and play a game. And, you know, I mean, yeah, Highbury was, that, <laughs> it was the best place I've ever played football. That and Wembley are the, the two places that, you know, just, um, it was a privilege to play there. So while you were away from Bournemouth, um, settled in at Arsenal, um, were you aware of all the financial goings on back at Bournemouth? I think I was aware of them before I'd left. Um, <laughs> you know, how, like I say, I talked about that Swansea game. Um, I remember Harry coming in the dressing room after, and literally his team talk was, "Lads, you know, we're, this club's twenty million in debt. I've not been paid for four months, and you lot play like that." And, you know, walked out, got in his car, and <laughs> we didn't see him till the Monday morning. And and then obviously he left. Uh, and you know, we knew th- we knew there were problems. You know, we there were months we didn't get paid. Um, uh, you know, there was one day in particular I remember. I don't think we'd been paid for six, seven weeks. Um, <laughs> my friend Derek McGregor, who I still speak to, I don't know if you remember him from the Bournemouth Echo. Um, yeah, Derek was ringing round everyone. Oh, yeah, you're not being paid, oh, you've not been paid. And we went into training and Tony said, lads, look, he said, I know the press are on. Um, he said, you'll be paid today. And literally we finished training. We went back to the ground uh, and we all had to go into the chairman's office and Norman A would bless him, lovely guy. And I'll never forget, he, he bent down behind the desk and he picked up this Sainsbury's carrier bag and literally he looked at it and he just gave you a wad of notes and you know, we got paid cash. Um, and he said, "Oh, thank you, know, thank, thank you for not saying anything." So we, you know, you knew the club was in debt. You knew the club was uh, was in trouble. Um, uh, you know, and I think it was a long, a long, painful process. Uh, and it, it it took a long time. You know, even then, when I came back in later years, uh, you know, in, in coaching roles, it was still going on. Is there any appearances for Arsenal that do stand out, Vince, or? Um, would you say it's similar to the situation at Bournemouth where you don't really dwell on them? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to sound a bit hypocrite. Yeah, it's exactly the same, you know, walking out at Old Trafford in an Arsenal-Man United game or, you know, Newcastle. No, it, you know, I'm, I'm being facetious now. It, it, so, uh, you know, you, you do realise the, you know, the, the difference in, 
you know, sort of in those days, Division Two football and the Premier League, um, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and and when you're at a club like Arsenal, you know, it's the it's the daft things, you know, going into London to get measured up for an aqua suit and, and you know, you have to carry your little um, suit holder around everywhere, and you know, you're getting on the coach all suited and booted, and then you come back on the coach after a game, and just, you know, sort of dining room set up and you've got people, you know, waiters serving your meals. And, you know, <clears throat> when I went there, George Graham said to me, he said, we do everything for you. All you have to do is worry about going and playing football. Um, and and I, I know what he was trying to say, but in those days, he, they were still a million miles away from that. Nowadays, literally, I think the players do, that. all they have to do is go and play football. You know, there's, there's advisors, there's people, welfare at the club. You know, they need a mortgage. Someone will get a mortgage advisor in to speak to them. You know, they, they literally do just go and concentrate on playing football. And, you know, Arsenal were ahead of the game in those respects, um, uh, you know, in a lot of things. And, you know, that's where you, you realise the difference. But like I say, you know, I was, I was just, uh, you know, looking back now, it's a privilege to, to play any game at Highbury for, for Arsenal, walking, I'd say, into the Marble Hall, into those dressing rooms. Walking down that that corridor onto that pitch uh, was was a privilege, and then to be in, like say involved in games, uh, you know, walking out at Old Trafford, Newcastle, you know, Newcastle away. Um, I had one of my best games ever. I've never got the video of it. Um, I've seen the goal again. For I was, you know, I say you know it was the best game I've ever had uh, for ninety four minutes, and then Peter Beasley stuck one in the top corner. And literally, we kicked off, right is passed to Johnny Hartson, and we've not even had time to get out the centre circle and the rest blown for full time. Um, you know, that's one video I would like to see one day. Um, but yeah, they're, 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 they're the high. They're, any, any day you pulled that shirt on was, was a highlight. So, uh, late 1997, you spent 12 games out on loan at Huddersfield. How did that come about? Um... Uh, Eric Steele. So Eric Steele had been my coach at uh, at Wolves. Um, he was again. You know, we talk about difference in times. You know, I think every club in the country's got a full time goalie coach now. You know, Steele was at a Championship club, Huddersfield, two days a week, and he was doing Barnsley two days a week. He was doing Derby three days a week. Um, so you know, that's how goalie coaches made a career. But Huddersfield again, they were bottom of the league. Um, I think. 12 games into the season, they'd got four points. Brian Horton had just been sacked. Um, the the manager was um, uh, Jackson. Uh, oh, God, what's his name? Peter Jackson. Uh, and Terry Yorath was the assistant. And they needed it. They wanted a goalkeeper. And Steely recommended me. Uh, and I went up there. I had two months. Uh, absolutely loved the place. Uh, you know, I was looking at houses. And I, I said earlier that, you know, the 18 months trying to get away from Arsenal was my lowest. The day, I, you know, the, the deal fell through, uh, it was literally three days before Christmas um, and it, it all fell apart. And I walked out and uh, I, rang, I rang Arsenal and, uh, you know, they were brilliant. They said, look, go, go home. I went back to the Midlands to mum and dad and had Christmas and just had a few days, and that that was probably the the lowest time. Um, I was I was gutted that you know because I thought that's it. That, you know it was a champ club. We'd we'd sort of done that, done well. We we were sort of uh, you know sort of mid table um, by Christmas, uh, and yeah, it, it it all fell apart. And uh, yeah, I was I was gutted. You spent a short time. Thank, thanks for bringing that one up. <laughs> 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 no, I did again from the football point. It was, it, it was games. I put my put my name about a bit again, and you know, sort of a couple of games on the telly. We we beat Man City on Sky, uh, one nil, keeping a clean sheet, you know, a couple of saves, and you know, just little things like that. So, uh, you know, and it, 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 things. I, I'm a big believer things happen for a reason, and um, you know, you you need you need a kick in the teeth, um, you know, to bounce back from it. And whether I needed it, whether it was a what I needed at the time. Um, uh, you know, we, yeah, ultimately, uh, I think it turned out all right again. You did spend a short time, Vince, under legendary Arsenal manager <coughs> Arton Wenger. <coughs> he was said to be revolutionary at the time. What did you think of him? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was... Uh, <laughs> how do I put this? Um, 
he was different uh, when he, especially when he first came in. And you know, I remember sort of Arsenal, the old Colney change, uh, uh, train, train, training ground. Sorry, um, we used to the lads used to line up outside and uh, outside sort of like the physio room, and we'd wait for the manager. And you know, the man, George Graham days, he'd come out and do a little talk about what we're doing in training. And and uh, I remember this this day. So Arsenal had been announced in September, but because of the Japanese season. He didn't actually come in until the October and uh, we're all lined up and, you know, waiting to, and this guy walks past and he was in like a 1980s Arsenal shell suit, you know, the glasses, you know, he looked like a, a, a well, well, one of the lads said something I won't repeat, but it was, uh, wasn't very common. <laughs> you know, he, he walked past and he just, he just turned and went, good morning. And everyone like that. And yeah, football has been footballers of a few smirks and, uh, but yeah, that that was first appearances. Uh, you know how run can you be? He was, he was, um, yeah, he was groundbreaking. Um, he changed, he changed everything. Um, not everyone liked all the changes. My missus still hates him for making the players' lounge a dry lounge after a game. She couldn't get a drink, but uh, you know that was <laughs> that was one thing. Um, but no, you know, diet. He was massive. You know, the the biggest thing uh, was was things like the diets, pre-match meals. You know, the lads had to eat certain things. They, they had to eat things in a certain order. And it was, uh, I remember the, um, so you do, you'd have like little crudity starters. So little, I don't know, celery sticks with uh, dips and, and that. And then was it you had to have your pasta and then you could have your meat and, and veg dishes and you had to have it in this certain order. And um, I remember the reserves trying to do, you know, after about three or four months where the first thing were flying, they, they said, right, we're going to do it with the reserves now. And we took a strong reserve team to Oxford. Um, and, you know, it's pre-match. Yeah, we're going to have this pre-match. And we had all this up. And we got done 7-0. I remember the lads all after that. Like, I can't eat that much and then play football. And it, it was like, it, it took time to, to get used to it. And, you know, it, it, it was so different. But the, the proof was in the pudding. Uh, you know, the, we were taking capsules again. It, Nowadays, it's probably sort of, uh, you know, everyone does it, but we were taking creatine tablets and caffeine tablets and vitamins and, you know, um, yeah, it, it was the daft things. I remember Lee Dixon, um, <clears throat> he, he, they flew him to the south of France uh, to see a doctor. He'd got a, an injury and when he came back, he, <laughs> he walked in the dressing room and I, how was it? He said, he said, just saw this doctor and... He said, I don't know anything about you. He said, just sit and I examine. He said, he opened his mouth and he said he stuck his finger in his mouth. And I went, yeah, you've done your meniscus and your right knee. And Lee was like, yeah, how did you know that? Just like, I mean, it, it, so it was some of the things, you you know, which doctors or what, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, it, 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 was, it was different. It was groundbreaking. It was different. Um, and they were, they were ahead of the game and that's what, what uh, did it for them for, for years and years. And then, Unfortunately, I think other people cottoned on and, and you know, did similar in different ways. And, and um, you know, the, the, the Arsenal sort of went then sort of fell behind others. Uh, and, you know, they're not really cut or they're just starting to catch up by the look of it. But he was also a very good coach. I've got to say that, um, <clears throat> you know, some, some Sundays you'd go in, uh, you know, being in the reserves or the stiffs or the mushrooms, whatever you call it. Uh, you know, some Sundays you go in and there'd be like four or five of you that weren't involved on the Saturday. And normally they're, they're horrendous sessions. But I remember coming away on a Sunday, you know, like you'd have a session with Arson and I don't know, someone like Kevin Campbell maybe who hadn't been sort of playing and Dickie, Paul Dickoff, my mate. And, you know, you'd have a small group session and you'd come away buzzing because it was such a good session. And, you know, it's like, well, that, that shouldn't happen on a Sunday like that, but because he was such a good coach, um, you know, he, he had that to back it up as well as all the the, the, the quirkiness and the uh, the different things. So uh, Tony's <laughs> this game back from in nineteen ninety eight for a loan deal, um, and then he eventually signed you permanently. I think that summer. Well, it, um, yeah, it was, it was the quickest loan deal ever because apparently two days uh, after I signed on loan, they made it permanent because then that enabled them to sign another loan. But they, they never told me about it. I only found out the, about 18 months later. <laughs> so, what was the main attraction to, to Gillingham? Was it working with Tony again or was it just craving the first team football? Or 
Well, it, well, it wasn't. It wasn't the area. I can guarantee that. <laughs> he, did, he didn't take me around uh, around the Medway towns. That, no, that, you know, that, it was it was first team football. Um, you know, it was, I knew Tony. I knew him well. Um, you know, when he sold me, they were they were pushing for promotion. You know, they they'd done well for they'd gone out of league or what was League Two in those days. Uh, you know, the, the old fourth division. Um, they'd done well, and he, they wanted to kick on and. You know, he he wanted me to be a part of that, and uh, I fell for it. No, no, I just I just wanted to play first team football again. Um, obviously, there were a couple of lads, uh, Bournemouth connections down there. Neil Masters was there, AD Pennock was there, uh, Mark O'Connor was a was a coach, uh, you know, down there, um, and obviously Tony. So um, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was it was an easy decision. Your first full season, though, you reached the playoff final against a very strong Manchester City team um, in one of the most memorable playoff finals of all time. What can you remember from that day? Oh, well, I remember everything because they keep sh- Sky keeps showing it every six weeks. <laughs> so, uh, every time I turn Sky on, it's on there. So uh, yeah, you can't exactly forget it. Um, no, I, you know, it, again, you know, great season. Um, Got into the playoffs, uh, beat Preston over two legs, um, and uh, you know I have to say the the second leg against Preston at Priestfield, you know the old Priestfield was, uh, you know you talk about the old Dinkle, Priestfield was falling down. You know you go there now, it's uh, you know it's it's a million times better than it was uh, you know when I first went there. But that that night we played Preston. The chairman did a great job. He got the local radio in. The, the speakers, the fireworks, it, it, that was the best atmosphere I've ever played in. And, uh, you know, we, we, we got through and, you know, going to Wembley for the first time, um, you know, the excitement to all that, the build-up, um, and then to be involved in a game like that, you know, there's a bottle of champagne somewhere that, you know, I, I got man of the match. And, and yet, you, you know, it's... Uh, but I'm, I'm pragmatic that, you know, like I said earlier, you know, things happen for a reason and, I've said to Jill's fans, and you know, I, I did uh, something like this for for Gillingham, and I said I, I still believe it was the best thing for the club um, because we went back twelve months later and we we wronged the right, and you know we were better prepared then to stay in the championship for for three or four years like we did. Um, if we'd have gone up that year, beat Man City, uh, I, you know, did we have the strength in depth in the squad, the the infrastructure, Tony? left as well um so you know i i don't know uh maybe that's just me wishful thinking but you know I don't, it, it, it was an unbelievable game um you know, like i say I, 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 you know, we watched it literally three or four weeks ago in the message why do you watch this <laughs> you know, but yeah it's uh you know obviously my best mate as well on the other team dicky uh you know it's just yeah you, you almost couldn't write it what do you remember about uh, games for Gillingham against Bournemouth? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, some some not always good things. No, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was it was built up. I think with the, the Tony Pulis, um, AD as well. AD he was badly treated with Bournemouth um, with Mel Machin. You know, they they told him he'd never play again, and they they you know sent him packing and. And then, you know, he carried on playing for another six, seven years, uh, you know. So, AD, AD had a, a bit to prove and, you know, there, there was a few things. Uh, uh, I, well, I think the first game was the 3-3 at Dean Court came back. That was my first time back. I can't remember anything about the game, but um, I got a good mate, a guy called Gary Fenley. He was actually a bouncer in the, the clubs in the days. He then went on, he made a, a career in skips around Bournemouth and stuff. He's, he's still about, he's a good lad. He's a big lad. He was a bouncer. I think in the day he was like 24, 25 stone. And um, so I'm, I've come out for the game. And I knew, I knew, you know, everyone knew I was coming back and I was going to see people. So we obviously, I, the away team, we obviously went down the Brighton Beach end. And I can't remember why we, we changed ends before the game. So the toss up. So I've gone running down to the other end. So the Brighton Beach, uh, the South Stand, I got a nice welcome from them. Well, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, the game started. About a minute into the game, the ball goes down to the right hand side of my goal. I go to get the ball, and in those days, I don't think dis- they put the disabled people yeah, in front of the yeah, stand, yeah. in front of the side. So I go to get the ball, sat in a wheelchair, literally six feet from my goal, is my mate, Big Gary. All right, Vince. So I just started <laughs> laughing. So I'm having a bit of banter with him. 
the best one, the fans in the stand think I'm winding up. I'm, I'm giving grief to some Bournemouth fan in the wheelchair. So they, they're giving me grief for having banner with my mate. I don't know what I Don't ask me about the game. It was 3-3. Three, three, that's all I know about that. Um, and then, then another... <laughs> so obviously that was the year we, we got to, to Man City. And... Um, I came down during that summer after the Man City game. My missus is from Bournemouth and we came to see family. And I remember sort of being in the house and the Daily Echo was there. And uh, Neil, I think it's Neil Perrett, I, I had a message on Facebook with him the other night about a concert I went to. But uh, um, So uh, Neil had done a little piece and it was the middle of summer and he put something about the boredom of the summer. Um, make, I always feel better by thinking back to uh, Gillingham at Wembley and the faces of Messrs Bartram, uh, Pennock and Pulis and, you know, the uh, I get I get enjoyment from their grief. Or, so the, the, that, that was basically... And I was like, I don't like that. I'm not happy about that. So I kept it. And then the fixtures came out and I think we played Bournemouth. It was either September or October. It was quite early in the season. And um, literally the week before the game, I went in to see uh, t- um, Peter Taylor, who was the manager there. I went in to see the gaffer. I said, uh, gaffer, I said, uh, I was back in Bournemouth or something. And, uh, it, so he, he read it, turned up for the game. We walked into the dressing room. He plastered it everywhere. He plastered He put it on the walls. He went, that's your team tour. And all the lads were like, just read it. Honestly. And we went out. I don't know if you remember the game. It was live on Sky. But I think um, Steve Robinson scored in the first minute. But after that, we won four one, and it was um, it was men against boys, and uh, yeah. So Neil, if you if you hear this, that's uh, you know you you weren't to say a win bonus that day. It was, uh, but yeah, it's, it's stuff things like that. I, you know, I remember um, there's another one. Um, it was uh, the cup game, obviously with the uh, the bizarre the bizarre winning goal where um, Paul Shaw was about twenty yards in. Offside, but Easy, you know, yards I, I think, yeah. It, but it came. It, Jamie Day played it back, so you know he was onside. Um, and then that game as well. Uh, Jamie Day, who I know well, um, you know, uh, Day's his good mate. That was at uh, he was at Arsenal as a kid. Um, he he sliced Andy Hessenthaler's thigh. Literally, Hesse was in in hospital in Bournemouth for about two weeks. Um, the old blade Adidas blade boots. Yeah, sliced Hesse's thigh. Honestly, it was. You know, it was, uh, it, they they couldn't sew it up. There was all the again the old Dean Court, all the mud and everything. They, uh, they had to flush it out for about two weeks before they could sew him up. So uh, yeah, that's that things like that. we had good battles. Um, I think you know Gillingham were probably uh, we were older and uh, a bit more experienced. Um, Bournemouth were Bournemouth. Uh, you know, a lot of young lads, good footballers, wanting to play football. But um, you know, uh, I think. We had a good record, um, you know, from from our point, and uh, yeah, there, there was always a little bit on it, obviously, because of what you know the, the historical things. Um, but, you know, for me, I always enjoyed coming back and playing. Um, yeah, yeah. Probably people didn't like me coming back, but that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you had the heartbreak of the Man City game, but of course, as you mentioned, you went back a year later and was on the winning side at Wembley. What was it like that day? Uh, uh, well, what I can remember, the the, 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 the day, um, it, was, it was a different day, obviously, uh, you know, Wigan, with all respect, I think, you know, there was 58,000. I think Wigan took 8,000, you know, the year before. It was, it was 80, 88,000, and it was probably 44,000 from City and, and Gillingham. Um, you know, it, it was it was a half empty Wembley, um, but the Jules fans were, you know, it was amazing. And you know, to 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 go to extra time and you know, we were two one down penalty, and you're thinking, it, you know, you're just thinking it's never going to happen. Uh, and then we got two late goals. Obviously, Andy Thompson's header, literally two minutes from the end. And oh my god, it, yeah, it was just a, a, a just a relief. Uh, you know, the emotions. Um, and, and and a bloody good evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, after 200 games for Jinnam, um, your career has ended bizarrely by by another goalkeeper, I believe. Is that, <laughs> is that right? Yeah, yeah. I um, uh, play Millwall uh, at Priestfield. Uh, Ding dong game with four three up. I made a save in the 
last minute, it's gone out for a corner. And uh, Dennis Wise has put a ball into the box and I've come, I've got a punch. And I, I don't know how, I, to this day, I don't know if it's on the punch or I, I know I sort of, I was high in the air and something, for some reason, I ended up going head first, sort of like speared into the ground and I put my hand out. And I'm lying on the floor, and I, I, I just I could see my, my you know, my, my wrist was like a Z. Um, I knew straight away it was a bad one. Um, and bizarrely, the uh, the physio came on, and we called him Ming. He looked like Emperor Ming. He had the old sort of beard, <laughs> and, and Ming was like, "Come on, let's." I said, I've, "I've done my wrist, Ming." He said, "Yeah, yeah, the game's finished." He said, "It's all over." I was like, "Oh right, okay." So he's put my arm in a sling and went down the, the new tunnel at Priestfield and. You go straight into the physio room and I was there and within 20 minutes, I'm in an ambulance and I'm thinking, none of the lads came to see me. I nearly swore, but, you know, I, I, I said, not one of them came to see me. So I'll gutted for you. Anyway, night in hospital, cut long story. Uh, they sent me home. But, you know, uh, I, I was then booked in to see a, a private specialist on the Tuesday. I still hadn't heard anything. So uh, Tuesday lunchtime, I'm at home. I think AD was AD Pennant was probably the first person. Vince, we, uh, he said we we're in training today. We had yesterday off. He said no one knew you, you were injured. He said literally the final whistle went. We've all gone in the dressing room and you know no one even realised you weren't there. He said we've just heard you've done you broke your wrist and all. Anyway, from then on the phone didn't stop. I'm getting lad after lad. Next thing I get a phone call. This Scouse accent. I'm not good with Scouse accents, but I do it anyway. But <laughs> I go, uh, hello, I said, who's that? He went, Vince, it's Tony Warner, the Millwall goalkeeper. I said, hi, oh, Tony, how are you? So, oh, Vince, yeah, he said, uh, I'm so sorry, mate. I said, oh, it's not your fault. He said, yeah, you came out of nowhere. I was like, you what? He said, yeah, it was me that whacked you. He said, I, I've come up. He said, why has he put the corner in? He said, I thought I was going to score. And all of a sudden, you've come from nowhere and we've just collided. So, yeah, so I ended up, uh, broke a wrist in five places, had it pinned, had a little Meccano set with... Five five pins and three little bars holding it all in place for six weeks, um, but eventually, you know, I would got restricted movement, and I think that was the September, uh, literally January the first. I, you know, I, I took retirement. But yeah, so I'm on a on a website somewhere. Bizarre injuries caused, but you know, caused by another goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> At that point. You did decide to go into goalkeeping coaching. Um, how did you come about returning to Bournemouth as a coach during our minus seventeen points great escape? Well, the, the, we probably need an hour just for this. Uh, I didn't actually. <laughs> I didn't go straight into it. Uh, I say I, I took retirement. Um, Hesse asked me, "Are you staying in football?" And I said, "No, I've had enough. Um, you know, I've had enough of managers and chairman and." sort of press and stuff like that. Uh, I, 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 need, I needed to get away from football. So uh, I did that. Um, we were living up in, in Essex at the time. We had a few issues with the house and subsidence. So we needed insurance and works and blah, blah, blah. So we were, we were in Essex for two years after I retired. Um, I started working in a betting shop. I worked for William Hill as a manager, deputy manager, running betting shops for them. Then moved back to Bournemouth looking for work I got a job at um, well Seawoods then it's now Eden Eden Vauxhall down at Branksome uh, I was selling Vauxhalls for 18 months and so I realised I wasn't very good at that um, so I decided to try and get back into football and I set up my own little sort of soccer school goalkeeping school um, again Darren Wassell my, my mate uh, who's he's academy manager at Derby now he, he's got a a sideline, a coaching company called Soccer Stars UK, and I was going to set up a branch of that. Um, and then uh, I, I met Matty Holmes, and Matty invited me to come and manage the under nines. Matty was the academy manager at Bournemouth, um, invited me to come and help with the well, they were the under eights at the time, but then I took over when they became nines. And then John Saunders, a very good friend of mine, who's the uh, he was the managing director at uh, at Seawood uh, Vauxhall. He, he bumped into Bondi one day on a, on a flight and um, <clears throat> Bondi was looking for someone to, to coach the... Uh, it, it, he didn't want someone to coach the first team goalkeepers. He wanted someone to help the younger keepers. So Ryan Price and, um, you know, the, the young keepers that were there at the time. Um, so I, in the end, Bondi sort of called me up and he offered me a job 
um, £50 a, a, a session. So literally I'd go in on a Tuesday and a Friday, uh, a Thursday and do a couple of hours and 100 quid. And then there was the, like I say, I was doing a couple of nights with the, the Centre of Excellence. Um, and again, we go back to the money side. You know, it was uh, I was there for about 18 months doing that, that sort of dual role. And at the end of the month, I'd put in a paycheck, I'd put in a receipt. And some days, Neil Vash, who's still there, uh, you know, he'd, he'd just look at me and go, no, no, you're not going to get that. And I think out of 18 months and 18 paychecks, I think I got probably nine or ten at most. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it, it was strange. It was different, and it was you know a million miles from from where the club is now. What was it like to work with uh, young Eddie Helm? Well, Eddie was one of the so uh, there was there was Bondi when I you know I came in there was Bondi and then um, uh, Rob Newman and then Eddie was the the, the coach and and I was doing the goalkeeping coaches like I say two day a week. Um, I think Eddie was learning the game, learning his trade, uh, taking it all in. I remember even those days he, he notes and he was noting stuff down. Um, and yeah, yeah, you know, he, he was he was fine. He was good, uh, good with me. Um, obviously, then, like you say, we had the, the the year with the seventeen points. Didn't have a great start, so then Kevin went, and then Jimmy obviously came in. I thought you know, that was going to be good. Obviously, I played with Jimmy, um, uh, and yeah, uh, obviously, Jace, Jason Tindall came in with Eddie as assistant. Uh, sorry, with with Jimmy. Eddie then went back to be academy manager um, while Jimmy was there, which was you know strange. Um, and then and and then obviously you know the rest history as they say. And then you was goalkeeper goalkeeping manager at Southampton's academy, but you've recently moved over to goalkeeping scout and pathways monitor. How do those two roles differ? <laughs> um, basically, one's on grass and one's off grass. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's the simplest way of explaining that. Yeah, so you know, I, I left Bournemouth and I ended up going to um, Portsmouth for nine months. So you know, I only need Brighton and I've done every club on the South Coast. But uh, um, yeah, and then um, I got a full-time role at Southampton, 2000, August 2010. Again, lots of stories. Or you know, I could tell you lots more. But basically, went in there as academy goalkeeping coach, and then they upgraded it to academy goalkeeping manager, which just meant I oversaw uh, some of the goalkeeping coaches within the, the club. Um, and then about eighteen months ago, or just after COVID hit, um, yeah, a change of role. Um, you know, and uh, I was offered the chance to sort of get into the, the, the scouting side. So rather than coaching and on grass and, you know, kicking balls all day, I, I let other people do that. And, you know, I sort of, uh, uh, I'm now sort of goalkeeping scout um, for, for the club. Uh, but also, you know, I, I, the, if there's outfield players, obviously there's only two keepers and, you know, uh, a lot of the games in midfield. So, you know, they'll always ask me about outfield players. But, I, you know, I look at everything from under seven pre-academy uh, right to up to first team, and you know, there's I've been to Bournemouth probably more the last 12 18 months in this new role than than I had for the the you know the 20 years since I left almost. It's fair to say Southampton have got one of the best academies in the entire country. Would you agree with that, Vincent? You know, the outstanding players that they've had come through, yeah. And you know, Bournemouth fans probably won't like me saying it. Um, yeah. you know, uh, you know. Uh, I'll probably be honest, you know, I've probably lost a bit of affinity with Bournemouth um, over the years and, you know, with the, with the you know, the, the money side and things like that. Uh, you know, there's still at times, of, you know, I, I was sort of, you know, treated badly and I know people in the area, you know, sort of workmen that were, you know, did did jobs and never got paid. And, you know, you look at the money they're spending now, um, you know, the, there's a bit that you think, well, is, is that right? Is that fair? Um, but, you know, the biggest thing for me is, the, 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 you know the, the the training ground. They need to get that sorted. The academy. You know they don't they don't sort of uh, or they haven't invested in that in 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 the way they they probably could have done. And you know for for the kids in the area. You know again like I say when you know I was I was managing the under nines. The kids were all local kids, and you know there there were there were some good players. You know Sam Shering who 
that's just been sold to Northampton. He was in my under nines, and you know, there's there's others, Antonio Diaz, who's you know around the non-league scene, Connell Morrison and Wimborne and places like that. You know, they, they were lads in in a, in the academy, and you know, there's there's one thing that you know now Bournemouth have got back in the Premier League. Uh, you know. Uh, that, that they, you know, not learn from Southampton, but there's one thing that Bournemouth, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love for them to do. It's, it's, you know, get some of the infrastructure and give something back uh, for the for the kids in the area. You know, uh, you know, it, it, you need to spend money, and that's one thing Southampton do do. You know, when I went there, they were a League One club, and Les Reed and Matt Crocker, uh, you know, they they said we we've ring fenced the money for the academy. Um, no matter what happens with the first team, there is this money. We, we will invest it. And, you know, from that, you, you've had the, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with Luke Shaw, Callum Chambers, Prowsey, you know, people like that, Harrison Reed at Fulham, you know, lots of good lads that, um, you know, are making good careers. And, you know, I just hope Bournemouth, uh, you know, there's there's lads in around the area, you know, I, I won't just say the Bournemouth area, but Dorset and, you know, even going into Hampshire that, you know, will we'll benefit from Bournemouth getting back in the Premier League again. And the final final bit, your influence still shines to this day as a goalkeeper. Um, you know, I'm good friends with a gentleman called Brian Baxter. And um, we did mention this before um, we actually come on. His son, Jamal, plays for Christchurch. But you've got two sons who are aspiring and very good goalkeepers as well, haven't you? Yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're doing well. They're, um, Mars is 19 um, and he, he got into a Christchurch first team uh, last season. You know, men's football did well. Uh, you know, a couple of high, well, relatively high profile games, uh, you know, for, for Christchurch against some, you know, some decent teams, Hamworthy and Brock and Bashley. You know, they're, 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 they're good non-league teams and Mars is, uh, is into there. And then Heath, my youngest, um, you know, he, he's he's... He could be uh, he could be a good little keeper. Um, he's going to go to Eastley next year um, in their scholarship program. I've tried getting him into Bournemouth, but they won't have him because of me. I don't think. But uh, um, you know, he's, he's yeah, he's uh, he's a, he's a, a good uh, you know coming on developing. He's similar to me that he's a bit later mature and you know the uh, he's, I think he's uh, he's going to sign for Brock as well and play in their 18s and Dev squad. So. You know, uh, anyone in the area locally looking at grassroots keepers, you know, you might see my two boys and, uh, you know, uh, like I say, that's how I came in or got into the pro game and, you know, there's still a chance for them. Yeah, most definitely. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you tonight, Vince, and thank you so much for sharing your story. And it's been really, really interesting and all the very, very best at Southampton. I know we, I know <laughs> Southampton's not our most favourite side, but at the same time, you know, all the very best with the academy and um, all the very best to your sons as well. Cheers, thank you. And uh, you know, like I say, I'd, you know, I was a West Brom fan, but I was, uh, you know, I'd, I was brought up with West Brom playing Wolves and Villa and Birmingham and Coventry, those local dogs. And you know, the South Coast needs that. You know, there's what's wrong with Brighton, Portsmouth. Southampton and, and Bournemouth all being in the Premier League and having having local derbies and you know it's uh, I think it's better for the area definitely so yeah cheers and all the best thank, thank you so much Vince and thank you for everybody for joining us on this special show please do remember to hit the like the subscribe and the bell button below to be alerted to any new videos we do here on up the cherries in all departments please do check out our recent interview with Sean Teal, where he does discuss his time at the club, plus also Aston Villa and much, much more. We've also had Paul Mitchell on the show as well. And that's a really, really interesting interview that we had with him last week. We've also had Steve Fletcher, Steve Cook, Harry Redknapp, Luther Blizzard, plus much, much more. So please do remember to hit that like and subscribe button. Do remember to check out our podcast cherry picking where we talk about everything going on at dean court and do re remember the opposition preview shows will be back very very soon as well so until the next video up the cherries and we'll see you then <laughs>